A surprising provincial election upset and a seat won in a West Side Kelowna by-election confirmed her as the 35th Premier of British Columbia. When Premier Christy Clark won in the Okanagan, she said in four years she wants people to look at her and say she did what she said she was going to do. Premier Clark joins us today to review her to-do list and reflect on her Burnaby roots, her personal goals, her passions and her politics. Stay with us. It's good to be here with you today and with BC Premier Christy Clark, who was sworn in as Premier on March 14, 2011. Before that, she practiced up as a Port Moody and Point Grey MLA, served as Deputy Premier, Minister of Education, Minister of Children and Family Development, and Vice Chair of Treasury Board when Gordon Campbell ran the province. When she took a break from public service, she briefly fell into talk radio, hosted her own show at CKNW, and heard how the public really feels about hot button issues, leaks, squeaks and politicians in general. Having hosted many hours of open line radio myself, I know BC callers do not hold back, ever. <laughs> it's true. Welcome, it's true. Premier. Thank you, Fanny. It's so nice to be here. I still have people, when I was up in Kelowna campaigning, who say, I loved your radio show. I listened to it all the time. And it's amazing. I'm sure this happens to you. Mm -hmm. It's amazing the diversity of people that you meet, young, older, female, male. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, what did you learn behind the microphone about everyday BC people, everyday Canadians, their passions, their complaints? What did you hear most? I think, um, I think that people are less cynical here than in other places. Mm. I think people wanted something to be for, not just things to be against. And so what, you know, there are, in talk radio, you'll remember this, there are some issues the same people will phone in on them. You know, it's the complaining kind of stuff. But there are some things that capture people's, that really affect people's lives in a very real way. Occasionally you'll be talking about it and you'll get a very broad swath of the, pe mm -hmm. of the public. And people will be quite um, constructive about wanting to fix those things. And they're frustrated that government isn't doing more. Exactly. And as a politician, you can do more. And you interviewed politicians and you know so well they're uh, media trained yes, to a great degree. And it's very hard to get the answer out because they have been media trained, as many people have, not just politicians. It's true, but, you know, um, sitting on, having sat on both sides of it, mm. when, you know, I, politicians, when they're talking about what they're doing most of the time, now this isn't true all the time, but most of the time, they believe what they're saying. So they're, they're, they have a story the interviewer has a perspective or wants to create a story. And so those two things create the entertainment in between. But my experience with most politicians is they actually believe what they're saying. Although occasionally, I mean. Occasionally, you know. uh, they're told what to say. Yes. Uh, sometimes more than occasionally. So you were a big hit on the campaign trail. Uh, what do you think it will take for you to be a big hit as a premier? What do you need to do now? I need to deliver lower taxes. We need to start paying off our provincial debt. We need to create jobs and grow the economy. Those are the things that I said I would do, and those are the things we have to do. So that also includes balancing our budget and controlling government spending, because you don't get to any of those other things if you don't start with the premise of balance. So you said off the top, I want to be remembered for mm -hmm. doing what I said I was going to do. Mm -hmm. That's what people elected me to do, so I have to deliver on that. And when you wade into a thorny issue, uh, uh, peace and education, uh, uh, teachers in the classroom, <clears throat> this year? Well, I mean, this year we're working toward that 10-year agreement with teachers. I mean, that would be 10 years of labor peace. And we're starting to see the Teachers Federation wanting to engage, which is great. And, you know, for me, I think about it, my dad was a school teacher in Burnaby. Mm -hmm. He would have loved the idea that he could get an automatic raise tied to the rest of the public sector and he would never have to go on strike to get it because he loved his kids. He didn't want to miss a day of teaching. And your mother was a counselor. Yeah, she was a marriage and family therapist. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of counseling when I was growing up. I bet up. you did. Yes, uh, I've never been back since. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you'll need it again, trust me. Uh, the, um, the politician in you, when? When did you know that uh, you were in the right lane? That this was really your thing because you, you, you have done other things, obviously, as we mentioned, radio, and you, and you left uh, for a while to be mommy, mommy, mommy. 
And you, you ran for uh, mayor. You didn't run for mayor. You ran for the mayoral nomination. Mayoral nomination. Got beat by Sam Sullivan. Who's now working with you. Yes, mm -hmm. as an MLA. He's doing a fantastic mm -hmm. job. So what is it about public service for you? Um, well, you know, my mom and was a full-time volunteer for a long time before she started working. Um, so she, and she was doing daycares and building community. My dad was a school teacher and a school counselor. So they were all about giving back. You know, they were all about mm -hmm. contribute, contributing. So I absorbed that. All of my brothers and sisters did as well, this idea that public service was an obligation. And not just an obligation, but for them, it was really the most fulfilling part of their lives. That's what I observed. So when my dad, after school, would stay and coach the basketball team and miss dinner and come home, he would be charged up from that, you know, working with the kids and doing things outside of his regular job. That inspired me, I think, and it really, it was an example that I, I mean, I want to set that example for my son, too. Uh, and I think you do, because I recall, and you can't believe everything you read in the paper, but when uh, it looked like you were not going to win this election, according to the pollsters anyway, I don't know what you thought, but uh, Adrian Dix pretty much thought he had it wrapped. Well, the Vancouver province had a, had a front page that, with a picture of Adrian Dix that said, this man could kick a dog and still win the election. I remember. And <laughs> Michael Smith wrote a column or something about that very thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, in fact, so, I, you know, that was kind of the low point, I'd have to say. And so if you ask, you know, you ask me, well, when did I know that this job was really for me? Mm -hmm. It was, Fanny, over those last two years before this election, when we were, you know, we were so far back in the polls, nobody believed that we could win this election. Nobody. And uh, yet, when that happens, you have to dig deep and decide that you believe in yourself. And why do you think you won? Because I believe in something. I think we won because we stand for something. And elections are a battle of ideas. And so, you know, we stood for a strong economy. We stood for jobs, low taxes, controlling government spending. And we were crystal about how we were going to do it in our platform. And I, did, I don't think our opponents really were clear about what they stood for.